Chapter 11 of the Functional Programming Tutorial Computations in a functor context uh, have been one of the themes in this tutorial and this is a, a final part of this which uh, talks about monad transformers. To begin, uh, let me look at some code that uh, needs to compute a value in the future, but the value uh, is of optional type. So these kind of computations often happen in uh, application code. When you are computing some value in the future, but the value itself has additional logic, and option is the simplest such example. So uh, imagine that we would like to implement a program that computes a value using a future. And then if this value is um, a non-empty option, the computation continues. And then it can computes another value again in the future using what was computed before. And that computation again returns an optional type. And we again see if that is a non-empty option. And if so, we continue and um, return another future value and so on. And if at any time this option is empty after having computed it, we need to stop. So we uh, shortcut the computation by returning a future of none right away. So that's what we have to do. So the code then starts looking like this. Now I just write here option of one um, and very simple computations um, for which I wouldn't have to do such uh, coding. But in real life this is a function that takes time to compute, so I put it uh, into a future, and then it might return an empty result. Um, I don't know that in advance, let's suppose, and then I need to match on that result. Um, so you see this code is quite difficult to read um, and difficult to modify, that is to maintain. And the reason is that it's full of repetitions. So there are all these match expressions that always have the same structure. Um, if there's a sum, then we continue. If there's none, then we return future successful. Now, it is precisely that kind of repetition that was eliminated uh, by using the functor block or the for yield block. Uh, but so we eliminate them, but only for the outer uh, type constructor. The inner type constructor remains, and we still have to do the same thing for it. And uh, we could not use the same uh, for yield block to deal with the future chaining and the option chaining because this is a limitation of the functor block. The functor in which we perform the computation must be the same throughout the entire functor block. So the for yield uh, delimit a block of functor computations where to the right hand side of the arrow there must be always the same functor type. So future in this example once the first line is giving you a future, everything to the right of the arrow must be of type future of something. So it's future. This also must be future, which it is. We're have, having to write code like this and so on. So it could not be that in the next line I write something like x uh, is equal to x, x going to x opt. Uh, this uh, would not actually compile um, 
because this xopt is of type option. It is not of type future of something. So this would not actually compile. Um, and that's why we need to write this code. So um, this difficult to write and difficult to maintain code um, unfortunately is unavoidable if we um, simply use the functor block on a type constructor that is nested when we have one monad and composed uh, in the type constructor with another monad like this we will have this problem whenever this happens so this could be a future of option or it could be a list of either or any kind of combination like that uh, will give rise to uh, ugly code of this kind. So uh, one solution that could be easy to implement is to wrap this type constructor into a new class for which uh, we implement uh, a monad syntax directly. So here's how it works. So we create a type wrapper, which is just a case class with a single value inside. And this wrapped value is of type future option. And now we directly define for this case class the methods map and flat map. And, and they're defined by simply doing a nested map and the, and the map inside. So that's uh, uh, nested flat map. And then we write this code where we um, match on the resulting option by hand. So, so this basically replaces all the repetitive code um, above, where in the case of none, we return a successful future of none. And if the case of non-empty option, then we continue. We, we continue with the next computation. So that is the flat map uh, defined for this wrapped class. Once we have done this, uh, we also do some convenience functions, um, which I will talk about later, such as the lift. Um, and I define for convenience some implicit conversions so that I can just convert future of uh, A into this future option where I promote A to option trivially by using some apply. And uh, another implicit conversion converts the nested type constructor into a wrapped nested type constructor automatically. So that is what I do here. Once this is defined, the code above is magically transformed into this. So the pure computations are just examples. Like I said, this is a very simple example where I don't really need to do this future option stuff. In real code, this would be a function that returns a value of type future of option of something, and it could have been non-trivial. It could return a future that fails, or it could return a future that succeeds with an empty option, or it could return a future which succeeds with a non-empty option. And so now the code becomes very straightforward, easy to maintain. At the same time, I could do operations like this, or else directly on this type, where the or else refers to the optional type inside the future. I implemented the or else for convenience, like this. Uh, and the lift is a, uh, a function that transforms option A, option B, into a future option A to future option B. So this is kind of a lifting of that kind. 
so this is uh, the basic idea of monad transformers, namely how to uh, avoid having to write uh, repetitive code like this and instead write uh, with some, of course, some definitions that you need to do, but eventually you would write code like this. Um, so in other words, uh, we could say we have combined a future monad and the option monad into one big monad, future with option, which we can manipulate in a functor block directly, with no need for pattern matching or anything else. So all the pattern matching within the future is done automatically. So um, this is an example of uh, combining two monads. So uh, it is very often necessary to combine different monad effects. Um, where effect is uh, an informal notion, it is not a specific, clearly defined type, it is an informal notion um, which expresses the idea that in, in a monad m, the type of this function expresses a computation that takes a and computes perhaps the value of b uh, and also it computes something else, or something else happens while you're computing a value of b, or maybe you compute many values of b, or maybe none at all, or maybe you fail with some error message, or maybe something else happens. So whatever else happens while you're computing b from a in this function, that's the effect of the monad m. Um, and so an example uh, would be for option, uh, is that the computation can have no result or a single result. For list, computation would have multiple results. For either, it could fail to obtain the result and then report an error. Uh, for the reader, it always gives the result, but it needs to read an external value for that. Um, for writer, it always gives the result, but additionally, there is some accumulator, which is uh, of a monoid type, and some value will be appended to that accumulator. For the future, you might compute, compute a value, might fail with an error, but all of that will be run later. It will not be computed right away. So those are the effects of some standard monads. And often you would like to combine them. So you would like to have a list of either or a, a future of option or something like that. And there could be even uh, combinations of more than two you want to combine reader and writer and, and future at the same time. So how do we combine effects? Well I just showed you code uh, where I combined effects although it required me to do quite, a, quite some work. Um, obviously what you could not do is uh, you could you could not simply write uh, code with um, first a future of something which has a future type and then a different monad on the right side of the arrow that would not compile so if this has a type try and this has a type future they're not compatible future and try are not uh, compatible types and so this would not work. If you wanted to do that um, uh, you need to do something else. You'd have to unify both right hand sides into a bigger monad such that you somehow transform this into the value of a bigger monad. You also transform this into the value of a bigger monad so these operations are called lifting. So you lift this monad into the bigger monad. You also lift this monad into a bigger monad. 
And then if you can do that, and, and I have done this in my code I just showed you using an implicit conversion. So if I can do that, I can just write code like this indeed, and implicit conversions will take care. Or maybe I can just put some type annotations, and, in, and th that would take care of types, and then on the right hand side of the accumulator arrow, I will always have the same type constructor, and that is therefore going to be valid Scala code. So to see that this is not valid, it's easy to see that because uh, if we translate this into uh, flat maps, see the first thing is a sequence, the second thing is a future, so the flat map on a sequence takes this function but uh, the future is a different kind of type constructor than the sequence and the flat map has a type signature that requires a sequence here so that would not compile so um, the conclusion is that in order to combine different effects in the same functor block we need to unify all these effects in a new monad that is in some sense larger than all the previous monads and contains all of them so the main goal of uh, this chapter is to learn how we can compute the type of this new monad how can we decide what that type constructor is how to implement the monad instance for it for any uh, kind of monads that you might want to use. So there are several ways of combining two monads into a new bigger monad that we could try. And um, many of these ways just won't work. Um, so the easiest way would be, well, why don't I just take a product of these two monads? That's a monad, we know that. Um, the reason is that this is not what we need. This is a monad, yes, but it describes two separate values of type A, each having a separate effect on it. That's not what we need. We need a single value of type A that has a combination of two effects, possibly. And that's not what this describes. Now, maybe a disjunction, because that could be the first effect on A or the second effect on A. Unfortunately, this is usually not a monad, and even, even if it is a monad, this is really a choice between two different effects, or, or even two different values. It's not one value with, with a combination of two effects, with, with the first effect and the second effect. Remember this code with future of option? It is a combination. It is at the same time being computed in the future and it returns an optional result. So this doesn't work. Now, the next what we can try is functor composition. So we compose M1 and M2. We can compose in two different orders. And sometimes, indeed, that works. It is often a monad when you compose. So let's look at some examples. For if one monad is this and the second monad is this, then we can compose, and the composition is this type constructor. And that is actually correct. It is a monad. Similarly, future of option, as I just showed, can be combined and is a monad. Unfortunately, if you try to combine in the, in the other order, for example, do something like this or something like this, those are not monads. So you can combine option and reader, this is the reader monad, only in one order. You can com compose reader outside and option inside, but if you try option outside and reader inside, the result is not a monad. Also, you cannot 
combined state mona with other monads like this. So for example, neither this order nor that order is a monad. So from these examples we see first of all sometimes it works but sometimes it requires a specific order of composition and it does not work with the other order and sometimes it does not work with composition at all so I will show that uh, uh, later that the state monad is such that it does not compose with other monads in either order so uh, as a comment when composition works both ways and example would be either and writer so they can be composed in both ways this would be one result of composition this would be another and both of these are monads but these monads express different kinds of effects so for instance here we either compute result and write a message or everything fails we have an error message we have no result and no uh, uh, log messages here we have always a log message the computation may fail and does not give us a result of type a but the log message is always written so we can have an error message and a log message at the same time so these are obviously two different kinds of logic that you could express or two different kinds of effects. Um, so the task in front of us uh, is of course to avoid trial and error. We don't want to do that every time that we need to compose two monads. Uh, we need to have a general way of defining a new combined monads and uh, we need to show that it is uh, always a monad so that we don't have to prove things every time uh, when we write code so um, that is what we would like to achieve and we would go a very long way towards that goal in this chapter um, so what we would achieve is that uh, we will have a monad say big M, big monad, that somehow combines all effects. Uh, so instead of the code that I showed here, which is invalid, trying to combine the sequence, future, and try in a single functor block, that is not valid. But if we somehow define a big monad that combines sequence, future, and try in the same big monad then uh, we had also we would have uh, three functions for lifting I would call them lift 1 lift 2 and lift 3 for now which would lift a sequence value into the big monad a future value into the big monad and a try value into the big monad so then we could just write a functor block like this lift 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 after lifting the right hand sides are of type big M of something. This is now valid and this would work. The result would be of type maybe big M of int of something. Uh, here are two examples of these liftings. So combining future and option would require us to define two liftings option A into future option A and future A into future option A. So these liftings are easy to define and uh, that's how we would probably have to write code. Um, in another example suppose we want to combine list of try, list and try, so that works. Try inside the list, that works. Um, I don't think that try would work outside the list as a monad. And these are the two liftings, so that's easy enough. And you see um, that could work. Um, now, there's still, of course, a lot of work to be done 
if we were to go this way. For each pair of monads, or even for each combination, which could be very, very many, we would have to define these liftings. We would have to define the monad instance for big M. I haven't even talked about that. I haven't even said what the type of big M is for this combination. For these I know, but for this I haven't said that. So, how to combine list, future, and try in a single type constructor. Uh, this is a non-trivial question, which is not easy to resolve uh, by trial and error. And composition would not necessarily work. Um, we need also to check that the laws of the monad hold for these monads, which I also will check, but I haven't done yet. Um, so all these questions remain. Is it always possible? How to find such a type constructor? Is it unique? Are there several options, uh, alternative solutions? Are they some of them better than others? Um, these liftings, what are the laws that they have to satisfy? And, um, uh, and so on. Also, can we somehow reduce the complexity instead of having to define liftings for all possible combinations maybe define fewer and make other things automatic. So um, let me first uh, talk about the laws of liftings. So we uh, assume that there will be a monadic program uh, such as this one with some liftings and we ask what are the laws for these liftings. Now we assume that the monads M1 and M2 and also the big monad, whatever it might be, already satisfy all the monad laws. How would we argue about lifting laws? So for example, um, imagine a functor block in which we have code like this. So first we have a lifting uh, of a pure value. So we have an M1 pure and we lift it. So that becomes a big monad value. And then we continue with some big monad stuff. It depends on I. Now, since this is just pure, our initial code without liftings, which is incorrect, would have been just I going to the pure of x and then continuing with that i. Now, usually code like this is equivalent to this kind of code where we don't need to do uh, monadic arrow, uh, the left arrow. We don't need that if we just use pure. We just say i equals x and continue. And so we expect that with lifting it will be the same, that we can replace this code with this equivalently. And so this is a law that the function lift must satisfy. And if we write it down, it is like this. This is the law. Uh, now, of course, it's not very nice to reason about code. So I prefer to reason about um, a more condensed notation rather than Scala code syntax. And in particular, it is convenient often to use the Kleisley composition for monads, which is um, composition of functions of these types, the Kleisley functions. And so if we rewrite this code in terms of Kleisley functions, then it looks like this. Uh, the composition of the forward composition of pure of M1 and lift one, flat mapped with some arbitrary b, which is some x to big M of y, so this is this b, uh, must be equal to b. So that's uh, uh, what we get if we rem remember that the Kleisley composition is replacing this kind of code. So f composition with g is a function that is like this. 
another law is that uh, if we have a lifting of pure after some monadic computation, then we expect that this x again is just e uh, equal to i. There's no effect here. And this should remain so after lifting. So therefore, this code must be equivalent to this code. Writing this in code, it is the equation like this. And writing it in terms of the Gleisley composition, it becomes this equation. And of course, uh, the same identity laws must hold for the second monad and its second lifting. So these monads we consider to be on equal footing right now. And both of them need to be lifted into the big monad if this construction is to be of practical use. Now, these laws are kind of complicated. Let's simplify them. Um, these laws basically say that this function, this, um, this uh, composition of pure M and lift, is the identity for the Kleisley composition. So this pure M lift uh, uh, to the left of B equals B, and pure M lift to the right of B also equals B. And so this function is a unit for the Kleisley composition, but this monad already has a unit. Uh, in the Kleisley composition. Namely, it is this pure of the big M. And uh, in the monoid, the two-sided unit element is unique, and si similarly this is so in a Kleisley uh, composition. So if we have two different unit elements, U and U prime, then we can easily write this equation, which is that U uh, Kleisley product U prime it must be equal to u because u prime is a unit element. It also must be equal to u prime because u is the unit element. And so u must be equal to u prime. So the unit element is always unique. And so these two identity laws that we have seen here can be actually reduced to a single law. They're equivalent to saying that this com forward composition of pure m and lift is, must be equal to the pure function of the big monad. Um, so we have now reduced the identity law to a single identity law. And uh, let us now derive uh, another law for the lifting, which is that if we have some kind of lift one of everything, so we have a portion of a program that just uses the first monad and keeps lifting it into the big monad. We should be able to refactor this uh, into a monadic program that only works within the first monad and then lift the result of that program into the big monad. So this would be the equivalent program. First we do the flat map in the um, monad M1 and then we lift the result into the big monad. So this program, it is kind of reasonable, should be equivalent to this. If it's not, it would be kind of strange that I cannot refactor my programs. Uh, the idea is that lifting should be transparent. It should be just a type massaging for the monad. So Usually, if I have a monadic program like this, imagine there's no lifting, I can always refactor it. I can do this flat map somewhere else and then put the results of that flat map back here. I can always do that. That's the usual associativity uh, of monad. So I should be able to do the same um, if I lift into the big monad. So that law, when written out, it becomes this equation. Um, and 
unfortunately, you know, this is a little unwieldy to, to think about, so let, let us rewrite it equivalently through uh, the flat map function. So the flat map function, which I de denote FLM, it is with this type signature, which is not the same as the uh, usual flat map in Scala, but it is easier to reason about. Um, and then using this flat map, uh, we write this code like that. So we have a lift, then we have a flat map of this function, and then it's the same as first doing a flat map and then lifting the result. And both sides of this law are functions of this uh, type signature, lifting M1 into the big monad. We can further simplify this if we rewrite flat map through flatten. Now flatten has this type signature and the law becomes lift1 and then lift1 lifted or raised to the big monad using its map function and then followed by flat map in the big monad is equal to flat map in the M1 monad followed by lift. So these are easy to obtain if you remember that flat map is map followed by flatten. In other words, it's this map followed by flatten. So that's basically how I get from here to here. And the function Q disappears from the law in this formulation. So it becomes simpler. There's no arbitrary function from A to B, nothing like that. It's just uh, both sides are functions of this type. And there's only one type A involved as a type parameter. Whereas in this law, there is a function Q and there are two type parameters A, B. And in this formulation, there are two arbitrary functions, P and Q. So in this way, the, laws is simpli the law is simplified can be simplified even more. If you write it in terms of Chrysler composition, then it becomes a law that is for some functions B and C of Chrysler uh, type signature. The B lifted and Chrysler composed with C lifted is equal to Chrysler composition of B and C all lifted. Notice I, I am using two different Kleistley compositions in this law. On the left, I'm using the Kleistley composition in the big monad. On the right, in the monad M1. To make it clear, I use the subscript in each case. So this is maybe slightly more difficult to read with the subscript. So squint at it and imagine that the subscript isn't there. Uh, keep it just in mind, and then you see B lifted composed with C lifted is B composed C all lifted. So that's the composition law. In other words, uh, the lifting of functions before composition is equal to lifting of functions after composition. In other words, the liftings commute with the Kleistley composition and also the liftings commute with pure. Pure after lifting is the same as the other pure. And so the, the laws express the idea intuitively that these liftings, lift 1 and lift 2 of course as well, should commute with the operations of pure and flat map of the monads. So this is uh, how we can think about these laws and remember them. So the liftings must lift pure to pure and classly composition into classly composition. Um, additionally, the liftings must be natural transformations, but actually it is a consequence of the fact that they lift 
pure to pure and flat map to flat map or flatten to flatten or Gleisley composition to Gleisley composition. Now the term that I use for such functions that commute with monads and lift pure to pure and flat map to flat map is monadic morphism. So it's not just a function or a morphism, but it's a monadic morphism. In other words, it's a morphism that agrees or is compatible with the structure of the monad. Um, and it's a function between M1 and big M. So it is compatible in this way with the structures of these two monads. Whatever structure is in M1, it maps into the corresponding structure in big M. And uh, in the uh, previous chapter, we already saw an example of a monadic morphism, although we did not talk about it. I didn't talk about it. Uh, I talked about monadic interpreters that run one monadic program and obtain a monadic value in another monad. These must actually satisfy these laws in order to be useful. And uh, so monad, monad interpreters are always monadic morphisms. Unless they are, they won't be very useful. And now let me derive the naturality law for uh, this lift. Now lift has this type signature, so naturality for it means that um, if I have some function f from x to y, and I lift it to m1, and I also lift it to big M, so that's the f map of f m, m in m1 or in big M, then the lifting must commute with that. So in other words, first you lift and then you map x to y, or you first map x to y, then you lift, it doesn't matter. And that is the equation that we can write expressing these equivalences. Now we can derive this law actually from uh, the fact that lift is a monadic morphism. So this is not a separate law that we need to check once we know that it is a monadic morphism. How so? Uh, this is a derivation. Uh, F map can be expressed through flat map and pure. And that is a monad law for both monads. And then um, this is the uh, lifting law for flat map. And uh, instead of uh, saying this, so we, we write that. So this FLM of F pure is uh, the left hand side, or uh, actually the, the right hand side of this law is F map F lift one. So instead of F map F, I write this. And the result is that. And so in this way, I, what I'm trying to get is that I replace in this law F map through FLM on the right and on the left. And I hope that I get an identity after that. So I begin with the left hand, with the right hand side where I replaced F map through FLM. Now I use this law that FLM of some function and then lifted is lifting followed by FLM of this, where Q is equal to the composition of F and pure M1. So that results in this expression. We have lift 1, FLM big M, which I did not write, of composition of this Q, which is this, and lift 1. So that is here. Now I use the fact that pure M followed by lift 1 is pure big M. 
which is this law. Therefore, I have here f followed by pure big M. Now, this is flat map in big M. Therefore, uh, this is a, a law of big M, which is this, okay, which I can replace this by flat by f map with big M. So now the result is this, which is the left hand side of the law I'm trying to prove. So I started from the right hand side, replaced things in it identically, and I got the left hand side using uh, the fact that lift one satisfies the laws of a monadic morphism. So monadic morphism therefore is always a natural transformation. So um, how do we deal with the problem of combining many monads uh, and reducing the, the amount of work? Um, so to look at an example, if we combine this and this uh, monad, only this combination works. This is a functor composition of this and this, where the reader is outside and the option is inside. The other order would not work. This is not a monad. And so this destroys our hopes of somehow always writing a formula uh, combining m1 and m2 for arbitrary m1 and m2 using some kind of natural combination or bifunctor. Um, this would not work. Uh, and another example is that the state monad does not compose in any order with other monads. Uh, let me show some code that explains why that is so. Um, if I try to compose option with reader in the other order, then I try to I try to define flat map for that. So I define a flat map uh, with this type signature. So I get a, so this OR is an option of reader. And I need to get an OR of B from OR of A and the function A to OR of B. Now, if FA is none, we have nothing to do except return none. There's no A available in our data, so they cannot possibly use F and return some non-trivial OR of B. So we have to return none here. Now suppose we have a non-empty option and then we have a function r to a. So now how can we return an option of r to b? We have a function that takes a and returns this or of b. Now unfortunately we cannot use this f either because um, to use f we need a function we need a value of type a but we don't have it we have a function from r to a we don't have an r and so um, uh, we cannot apply to f to anything at this point we uh, have to decide in, at this point, without applying f, which will give us some option, we need to return either a none or a sum r to b. So trying to return a none here would be bad because then it would return none in both cases. So we basically have a flat map that always returns an empty option. And that has no hope of satisfying the identity law, which is that flat map of something with pure is equal to that something. But if our flat map always returns an empty option, this will not, never work. Um, so let's try to return a non-empty option. Okay, so we start returning it. We have a 
an R now. We can use this uh, function f by computing R to A of R, which is of type A, and applying F to that. So we get an option of R to B here. But we are inside this uh, function. We are required to return a value of type B. But we don't have that. We have an option of something which could be none at this point, could be empty. And if it is not empty, yes, we can return the value of type B. But if it is empty, we are stuck. We cannot return the value of type B. So there is no good implementation of flat map in this case. The pure we can implement, but flat map, no. Um, let's look at the state monad. So this is the state monad type constructor. So let's compose it with reader. Well, I need to implement a uh, flat map with this type signature where SR is this combination, which is a state with this reader inside. Now I will follow the types and there's only one way of implementing it. So we start with a function S, we need to return SR of B, which is S going to a pair of S and uh, R to B. So start with S, then we can compute uh, FA of S, we get these things. Now we want to return a pair of S1 and a function R to B. Now, how do we get a B? The only way to get a B is to apply the function f to some a. So we have an a, yes, we can apply f to a. We can give an r to that, give, get a b. So finally, uh, we get a b, but we have to discard uh, this value s that we uh, obtained last. So, and this is suspicious. Uh, in the state monad, we should not discard updated values of the state. S, but we have to discard it because we are returning, we must return S here, and the function R to B is inside. So we cannot give this S, which we only computed here, back over, over there. And this is indeed the problem, that we discard certain parts of the state. So essentially we have not used f in computing the new state. We have used f to compute the new value, but f only gives you, not only gives you a value, it only gives you an effect updating of the state, and this updating we are ignoring. And indeed it will violate the identity law, uh, which is this, uh, one of the identity laws, and I can show that this is so because if I compute the flat map according to the code over there, then it will be a function that always ignores the, uh, the value, which is okay, it's a pure, but it always returns the unmodified state S. So the first element of the pair is always going to be unmodified state S, and this could not be equal to F. It should it should equal f. Uh, this should equal f of x, but it cannot because f could modify the state like this. f could be of this form, which modifies the state, but uh, our flat map will never modify the state in this combination with pure. And so that cannot possibly be equal to f of x for arbitrary functions f. Now f uh, could have an effect and we should have accumulated that effect, we, we are not. Uh, now trying to compose p state monad with reader inside fails. What about composing it outside? Well, let's take an option, another simple monad, and compose it outside with state. Um, I will not go through this in great detail, but it's a very simple 
computation and basically either you always return none in your flat map an empty option which is bad or you're stuck you're trying to return the value you, you need and you don't get it you have an option of something but you need that value itself so you have an option in the wrong place and you're stuck you're not able to compute a b just like we're not able to compute a b previously so this shows that the state monad fails to compose with other monads in either order. So it does compose with some monads in one order and in, with other monads in another order, but you cannot in advance say, I compose the state monad outside with an arbitrary other monad and that result is valid monad. No, that doesn't work. Or inside, no, doesn't work. So um, this is a problem. And uh, the solution is actually what is called monad transformers. Uh, the main trick is that we're not going to try to combine arbitrary two monads. We're going to fix one monad, which we will call the base monad. And we'll, I will denote it as L. And for a fixed L, I will let the other monad vary. So that would be called a foreign monad. And we'll try to assimilate the foreign monad into a fixed base monad and combine them in this way. So the result is a type constructor, which I call TLM, and it still has a type parameter denoted here by this placeholder symbol. Uh, so this placeholder symbol is just a type parameter that I'm not writing. So. Um, I introduced this notation in the previous chapter, and in Scala, this is written simply like that. It's a type parameter that we're not writing. Um, so this type constructor depends on both L and M, and it gives you a new monad. And it is such that for a fixed L, this M is actually a type parameter. So this works for a fixed L, and for any M. So fixed base monad and arbitrary foreign monad. So that's what a monad transformer is. It's a type constructor. It depends on L and M, but it depends on them in a different way. So it is generic in M, but not in L. In other words, for each L, for each base monad L, there's a different construction TLM but the construction is the same for all M so at the fixed L the construction is the same for all M so in other words it's generic in M so um, right away it is important to understand that there's no general formula that takes a monad L and produces the transformer, doesn't seem to exist. Uh, so for each L, for each base monad L, we need a different construction of this T. M, the foreign monad, will be generic, but the base monad will not be just a parameter. And finally, there is a question whether some monads have a transformer or not. Now, I don't know how to answer this question, but I do have examples of monads that don't have full featured transformers. Um, and uh, maybe this is not a problem, um, but I do not have examples of monads where I don't know how to make a transformer. So. This question seems to be difficult and in practice every monad that we can write down um, as a type constructor will have a transformer or at least halfway. I will talk about this uh, in more detail very soon. Um, so what is the uh, advantage of 
having this approach of, of using this approach when we fix the base monad and vary the foreign monad. Uh, the advantage is that now we can easily compose three or more monads by simply composing the transformers. Since the transformer is generic in this monad M, I can put that uh, monad M as the type parameter uh, and I can set it to a transformer for a different monad. Now I'm missing here another type parameter, placeholder, um, but the notation is difficult as it is. So in Scala, for example, you would have transformers such as uh, state t of list t of reader. So you could do that with these placeholders, which correspond to my bullets. Um, and in this way, you can stack together many, many monads with no additional work. Once you have implemented a transformer for each monad, you can stack any number of them like this. So no need to have a combinatorial explosion in how many different transformers you need. Combine future and option, future and list, list and option, list and either, future and either. No. Uh, you just implement a transformer for list, transformer for either, transformer for option, transformer for reader, and then you just stack them. And this is called the monad stack. Uh, but make sure uh, you don't mix together the monad stack and composition of type constructors or functor composition because this is not the same as a simple composition like this. The transformer is not just a composition. For some monads it is, but for others it is not. Uh, like for the state monad, it is not a composition as we have seen. It cannot work as a composition. Also for some monads the composition goes inside and for others outside. The transformer is a type constructor that is always outside, but the result of it could be that some things are inside or, or even uh, tr transformed in some difficult way that is neither composition inside nor outside. So monad stack is not the same as composing type constructors like this. This is not a monad. Uh, this would not work. Monad transformers will always work. They will always produce a monad satisfying all the laws. So what are the requirements for monad transformers? Uh, for all foreign monads M, there must be the following properties. So first of all, this must be a monad, which I call the monad M, transformed with this transformer TL. So it's a foreign monad that has been uh, assimilated somehow onto the base monad and the result is this big larger monad that has both effects. There must be a lifting which is this function, monadic morphism between M, the foreign monad, and the transformer. There's also the base lifting which lifts the base monad into the transformer, uh, but it is not natural in L because the L is uh, not a natural type parameter or not generic type parameter in the transformer. Another property is that if we take the identity monad as M, then the result must be equivalent to L. And this is not natural if, because the identity monad does not have any effect. So if we uh, transform that, assimilate that, then just the effects of L remain, and that's the same as just having L. Uh, now, the fact that the transformer is monadically natural in the monad M means that there are these, these other properties, namely um, T must be 
parameterized by m as a type parameter. And for any other monad n, we could we should be able to uh, map m to n inside the t. So if we know how to map m to n using some monadic morphism, then we should also know how to map transformed m to transformed n. So this I call m run. So uh, if I know how to run the monad m into some other monad, then I should know how to run the transformed monad into the transformed other monad. Also, these runners must commute with lift and base lift. So if I first lift and then run, uh, for example, if I lift L and then I run, uh, uh, then I should obtain the same result as when I first uh, run and then lift. So we'll look at uh, the precise formulation of this. Uh, a little later. Now this naturality will always hold automatically as long as we implement this monad only using uh, the monad methods of M. We don't use the structure of M but only call its methods pure and flat map. And this situation is um, similar to what happened in chapter 9 uh, when we talked about, I talked about traverse. So this traverse had this type signature and it was natural with respect to applicative functor f. So it did not use the structure of the functor f, only the fact that it was applicative. And this uh, therefore uh, can be used to run the monad. For example, take this runner if it exists and lift it to this runner which is a runner from Tm to L. So we can eliminate the effects of M or run them, evaluate them, uh, perform them, and get just an L. Which are, so effects of L and M are combined in this monad. We can separately run or evaluate effects of M and the effects of L should remain. Similarly, there should be a base runner where uh, we can run the effects of L inside the transformed monad and the result is just M left. And that's the base runner. And again it should commute with lift and base lift. Why do we need these runners? Well, the only way to evaluate monads is to run them, to actually perform the effects. And unless these laws hold, Performing the effects would give incorrect results uh, when we combine the effects. So we should be able to combine the effects without changing our ability to run them separately. So we can combine L and M effects, but we can run L and not M. Or we can just run M but not L separately as much as we can, um, uh, as much as we need to, to separate them. So these are the requirements. Um, and uh, I will go through these requirements later to prove that they hold for all the monad transformers. Here are some first examples. Um, if uh, we have a reader, then the reader composed outside works. If we have this uh, monad, which is a combination of either and writer, then this can be composed inside. Uh, these are monad constructions that I have proved in uh, chapter 7. And actually these are uh, monad transformers for, for these monads, for the reader and for this monad, which is a combination of either and writer. So therefore, uh, these are the transformers. Uh, Reader T, either T, and writer T, which we can write down immediately, already having proved that these are monads. We still haven't proved other laws, but we have proved that the com com combined types are monads. Notice that the reader composes with the foreign monad from the outside, 
but either and writer compose inside the foreign monad. And this must be so. Other, the other way around is wrong. It doesn't work. It does not produce a monad for arbitrary m, which I just showed you in code. Um, the remaining questions uh, for us are, so what about other monads? So now we chanced to know this before, but what about other monads? We don't know. And they don't compose. Uh, ne neither of them composes inside or outside with arbitrary other monads. So we also have a lot of other monad constructions. How to find transformers for the results of those constructions if uh, we use them? And if we know transformers for some previous monad, we made new monads out of previous monads, how to find transformers for them? What about monads constructed using a transformer? What's a transformer for that? Um, and uh, whether it's always possible. Well, uh, like I said, it is unknown. Maybe there are some monads that don't have transformers. I haven't seen good examples of that. Um, now, is the transformer unique? No, it is not. I will show why. But usually there is one transformer that's preferred. That's the simplest. And um, that's what people usually mean when they say the monad transformer. And another final issue is all this boilerplate around lift. Now, lifting is still quite cumbersome. You need all this lifting. And the code is cumbersome because there are all these, you know, especially if you have more than two monads combined, then there's lift of lift of lift in different orders. And that makes code uh, difficult to maintain. So there are solutions for that which are called MTL-style transformers. MTL stands for Monad Transformer Library. So I'll talk about these issues in order in the rest of this chapter. Um, here's an overview of all I know about Monad Transformers. Um, each Monad has a different transformer, so it's really a zoology and uh, each construction is ad hoc, so there's no general method for them. So some monads have a composed inside transformer. So these are the option, writer, and either. For each monad, we need to know what that is, so uh, we will see how that works. So for some monads, it's composed inside. For others, it's composed outside. So this is the formula. Um, what are those monads that compose outside the reader? And also there is a monad called the search monad, uh, which is this type, which I have shown before uh, in chapter 7. Um, I didn't call it explicitly a search monad, but this and similar monads have transformers that compose outside. And more generally, I uh, define, I will define a class of functors that are called rigid, and monads that are rigid all have outside transformers. So they're kind of, they're, they're uh, generalizing a reader and this kind of monad. There are several other such types. Um, another type of monads is recursive. The list, non-empty list, and the free monad um, they are defined recursively and neither of the compositions work for them. They need a different construction, which is uh, interleaving the base monad and the foreign monad inside the recursion. So it cannot be just composition. Um, another type of monads is monads obtained from constructions. So for example, product of monad. Uh, has a product of transformers. So you need to know the transformer for L1, transformer for L2, and then you make a product. That is the transformer for the product monad. Another construction that I already described in chapter 7 is this. We have a contrafunctor H, and we have a function from it to A. So this construction works for any contrafunctor H and gives you a monad. And this monad has a composed outside transformer. It is rigid. 
Another class of monads is free-pointed monads. This is also a construction from chapter 7. A transformer for that monad looks like this. It's neither uh, composition outside nor inside, and it requires you to know the transformer for the monad L. And then you know how to define a transformer for this monad. Finally, there are irregular monads where none of these constructions work. For example, the state monad. For the state monad, composition doesn't work. These constructions doesn't, don't work. Uh, you need to put the foreign monad at the precise spot inside the state monad, and then it works. For the continuation monad, you need to put the foreign monad in here. Otherwise, nothing works. There is a, another class of monads that I call selectors. For them, you have to do this. Again, it's neither composition nor uh, uh, constructions like that. Finally, there is a codensity monad for which, again, you have to put uh, the foreign monad inside at specific places. So these are irregular. So each has its own recipe, and there doesn't seem to be much of a system here. Um, it is not clear that monads could exist with no transformers, but uh, one suspicious fact is that some transformers do not have uh, several of the required methods. So, for example, the continuation monad transformer does not have a base lifting. In other words, you cannot lift a value of the continuation monad into a value of this type. So continuation monad is A to R to R. You cannot lift that into A to MR to MR for arbitrary M. Now, this is a problem in my view. It means that these transformers are not fully usable. They kind of half work, but unless I can lift both my monads into a transformer, I cannot really replace in the functor block uh, the previous monad with the big monad. So in my view this is a problem and uh, you could argue that uh, these transformers uh, are incorrect. They're, they are not uh, fully featured, they do not satisfy the required laws. Um, I could argue that and I will talk about this later. So now I begin uh, with the composed inside transformers, which is the first class of uh, transformers in my zoology.